Alright, hello and welcome to block 8, uh, the second set of notes, North and South. Um, that if we're going to be talking about how the North and South uh, kind of split up and went their separate ways and, you know, soon enough fought this um, titanic civil war, it's probably a good idea to know something about them. Uh, the North, based on free labor, and the South, based on slave labor, had lots of other things about them that were different besides the fact of free labor and slave labor. Uh, so let's start up in the North. And for the purposes of our discussion, we're going to need to kind of look at a map here. Uh, map of the United States, 1860. That's not a good map. That's not a good map. Let's find a good map here. Here, this is a good map. Copy. That the North was kind of a combination of the North and the old Northwest. So if you if you can see the map. The North included New England, the Middle Atlantic states, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Uh, the North included Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, um, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. And that's the North. All right, it's a combination of the old North, New Jersey's part of the North, uh, and the old Northwest make up what we are going to consider to be the North uh, for the purposes of uh, this block and the next block, both the run-up to the Civil War and the Civil War itself. That is the North. The North, by 1850, the North by 1850 is an industrial, commercial, and agricultural giant. It is the second largest economy in the world, uh, only trailing Great Britain. Um, Northern agriculture. Let's let's take these three in turn. Uh, we're going to do agriculture and commerce and industry. Northern agriculture, we, 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 we imagine, and when we teach this, we say the North was an industrial society. That's true, but agriculture still remained the primary thing that most people in the North did for a living. That all throughout New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, there was small independent farms uh, who grew food for themselves and food for market. Most northerners are not living in cities. Most northerners are not working in factories. Most northerners are farmers. And in the 1840s, due to some uh, weather issues in Europe, the price of food around the world went up. And because the, dem the demand for food went up, the price of food went up, and the supply of food went up to meet that demand. Throughout the North, land was plentiful. There was always plenty of land to be had, but labor was expensive. A person would not work on your farm unless you paid them a pretty good wage. Uh, and obviously there was only so much work that you and your family could do. So because there was lots of work to be done and lots of money to be made doing that work, necessity became the mother of invention. Uh, so the North came up with many different inventions that helped produce lots and lots of farm goods. Uh, and two of them are worth talking about. These, in well, before we get to the inventions, these inventions and the fact that they were constantly coming out of the North uh, gave a name to this called Yankee ingenuity. That Yankee was a term for somebody from the North, and ingenuity, that means that these Yankees, these Northerners, when confronted with a problem, would come up with some kind of technical solution to solve it. Uh, and the first example for farm uh, tools that helped farmers become more efficient and produce more food for cheaper was the steel plow, invented by John Deere. And, of course, the John Deere company is still going strong. Uh, he invented the steel plow in, 18, uh, in the early 1850s, and by 1857 he was selling 10,000 of these steel plows a year. You hook them up to a team of horses or a team of oxen or a team of mules, and it could cut deep into the soil. Um, you could grow excellent crops. Sometimes in certain areas, you know, you could do two crops a year. That this steel plow cut into the soil, turned it over quickly and efficiently, and with a good team of animals, you could plow a field better and faster than ever before. The other great invention was uh, invented by a man named Cyrus McCormick, and he invented the horse-drawn reaper. 
Now, all you Elizabeth kids don't really know the first thing about farming, but when the crops grow, you have to cut them. And handheld reapers, scythes, you'd have to go out into the fields and whoosh, 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 uh, cut down your crop. And then you'd have to go back and you'd have to collect it all and, you know, deal with it at that point. Well, Cyrus McCormick invented a machine that you hooked up behind your two horses or your two mules or your two oxen. And as they pulled this machine, it not only cut the crop, but it laid it on a little tray for you to deal with. Using McCormick's mechanical reaper, a farm worker could reap, could harvest, 14 times more wheat than he could as before. One person could all of a sudden do the job of, of 14 people, and that is an incredible increase in efficiency. The main crops of the North are uh, corn and wheat, especially in the Old Northwest. Uh, and then, with the coming of the railroad, which we're going to talk about more in a little bit, it became very cheap to ship these goods to market. Now, before the railroad, and especially before canals, food is heavy, food is bulky. You, even if you could grow lots of it, you can't ship it where it needs to go. So now, with the railroad and the canals, a farmer could grow as much as he possibly could and ship it to the cities on the coast where it could be distributed literally around the world. That by the 1850s, corn grown on farms in Iowa is being sold in London. And that's an incredible economic transformation, that a farmer in Iowa could make money selling corn in London. That's revolutionary, truly. And that's what happened. It made these farmers um, not wealthy, but certainly, certainly middle class. By 1860, as we said in a letter A, American farmers in the West are supplying most of the East's food and much of Europe's food as well. Commerce, trade, that after the war, uh, war of 1812 and all the problems that the United States had with trading with foreign countries, commerce kind of took a back seat for a little while as the United States focused on industrialization. But by the 1850s, commerce is once again in full swing. Great Britain is the United States' biggest buyer and biggest supplier. Great Britain is just soaking up American food and sending out, you know, uh, the finished goods that Britain in the 1850s is so good at supplying that there is becoming this important symbiotic relationship between the old mother country and her old colonies. Um, Trade-wise, diplomatically, we've seen that this relationship is getting to be very, very close. Um, not the best of friends in the world, but kind of dependent on each other. Changes in shipping. All of this foreign trade... Um, was aided by some significant changes in technology. The first are packets. That the idea that a ship would leave a port one day, show up in another port on another specific day, and come back on a schedule. The idea that ships came and went on a schedule is a new thing in the 1840s and 50s. And the first ships to do it were these packets. They were steady enough, sturdy enough, strong enough, ready enough that they could go on a schedule that Thursday, May 18th, the ship would leave New York and it would be in London 10 days later and it would be in New York 10 days after that. And then a merchant or a farmer or a, a businessman could count on that regularity uh, for his business. They're square rigged packet ships um, and they start the first regular service uh, between the United States and Europe. By 1845 there's over 50 regularly scheduled trips a week uh, between the United States and Europe. And the shipping starts to concentrate in a few major cities. Firstly New York uh, more than anything else, but also Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New Orleans. And as the routes get more regular other ports, like Boston, start to get left out, uh, and their economies have to change, that the great commercial ports become the center of American urban life, especially New York. Another important industry in the 1840s and 50s was whaling. Um, and if you want to learn about whaling, you read the greatest book about whaling ever written, Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Um, 
But because southern New England was kind of kept out of this new commercial revolution, many towns in New England turned to whaling to make their fortunes. Um, from 1830 to 1860, now Wales provided mostly oil that the blubber in Wales could be distilled, melted down to provide whale oil, and most lamps in the United States in the 1850s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s were whale oil lamps, which is worth having a look at here. A whale oil lamp. That's a decorative one. Most houses in the 18, here's a good picture. Most houses in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, this is how you lit your house. That there was a, a vessel filled with whale oil and it would burn and it would give off a nice steady light. Uh, this would be replaced in time, but for these 30 years, the demand for whale oil was so great um, that the entire whaling industry grew, grew and flourished. Whaling was dangerous, as you can probably tell by the picture. These sailing ships went out, and when a whale was spotted, um, the small boats were lowered off the whale, and they rowed after it, and with hand-thrown harpoons, uh, killed the creature. Uh, that would then be dragged back to the ship, hoisted up, cut apart, the oil drained, put in um, barrels, that a whaling voyage was often three years. You'd get on the ship, you know, one year, and you would sail around the oceans of the world for about three years, collecting enough whale oil to fill your hold and then back to port. Uh, most of the whaling in the world was done in New England. Uh, and like I said, read Moby Dick if you want to read a really amazing account, accurate account, of what whaling life was like on these small ships. Another technological change that came over was the invention of the clipper ship. The greatest, the highest advancement. Hold on, let's leave that up here for when we need to see uh, the south. That human beings have been sailing on the oceans for thousands of years, and the technology to do it has been changing for thousands of years. This is the pinnacle of sailing technology. Rapid improvements in ship design culminated in the most beautiful ships ever created, the clippers. Clipper ships are fast, and if you've listened to me this year, you know how much I love sailing ships and ships in the ocean and the sea and all that stuff, so bear with me. Uh, clipper ships are fast sailing ships invented to speed people and goods to the California gold fields. That you had to go all the way around South America. If you wanted to ship something from New York to San Francisco and you wanted to do it fast, this is the ship for you. They are very narrowly built, obviously, um, to perform at high speed. In a good strong breeze, these clipper ships could get up to about 30 miles an hour, uh, which is incredibly fast for a sailing ship. It's very fast for any ship, 30 miles an hour. That the top speed of a modern aircraft carrier is only about 40 miles an hour. Um, so you're talking a sailing ship in a good stiff breeze could make about 30 miles an hour. Uh, they could not carry much bulk cargo. That was for, you know, the bigger ships, uh, the wider ships. But if you needed speed and you needed fast, clipper ships were for you. Unfortunately, um, the kind of the heyday of the clipper ship only lasted a little while. Steamships soon replaced them, and there's not too many left in the world today. But as a culmination of thousands of years of human ingenuity putting into how to sail a ship across the ocean, they are the absolute pinnacle, and they are, without a doubt, the most beautiful ships uh, ever constructed. Unfortunately, letter D, beauty does not necessarily make money, and steamships had arrived. Steam boats had been plying the nation's rivers um, for many years, since the 1820s. But by the 1850s, advances in nautical technology and nautical design allowed steam ships to be able to go across the ocean powered by steam. Um, steam ships are slower in coming than steam boats because a steam ship has to carry all of its fuel that you can't stop in the middle of the ocean and take on more coal. And the more fuel you have to carry, 
the less cargo you can carry, and the less cargo you carry, the less money you make, obviously. By the late 1840s, though, steamships had advanced to the point where their average speed was faster than the average speed of an average sailing ship. So with money to be made, the sailing ships were mothballed, broken up, and destroyed, and businessmen and industries put their money into building these iron giants. It took about 10 days to cross from uh, New York to London. The iron ship, first wooden ships became steamships, and then iron uh, appeared. They were larger, cheaper to maintain, and could hold more cargo. Take a look at the picture. That's USS Savannah, the first ocean, one of the first ocean-going steamers. You can see the big uh, funnel, the smokestack, in the middle of the ship. Um, powering the side paddle wheel, the paddle wheel on the side, but obviously notice that she kill, still carries sails as well to kind of as a backup and to kind of help her along. Um, the coming of iron and steam uh, for ships took the American shipbuilding industry, which had been the best in the world since colonial times, uh, and it made it take a back seat to Britain for a while because Britain was at the forefront of developing uh, all of these new iron and steel working and machine and engine technologies. One other um, consequence of steam and iron in ships and regular and cheap uh, shipping between the continents, between uh, Europe and North America, uh, would come in the form of uh, immigration that all of a sudden more ships, regular ships that could hold more and were more regular meant that the price to come to America was a lot cheaper. That in Europe, very all but the poorest of the poor could sell their possessions and buy a ticket on one of these ships and come to the New World. And that is going to start in earnest in the 1840s with the Irish. We're going to talk about them in a few minutes. Um, but it is the fact that the technology of steamships comes around that allows um, the poor of Europe to buy passage to the United States. Agriculture, commerce, and now letter C, industry. From 1812 to 1860, industry in the United States grew by leaps and bounds. The factory system grew from the small factories in New England, uh, like in Lowell, with, with you know 20 or 50 employees. Now you have huge industries all over the Northeast with hundreds of employees at a time. The factories no longer have to be situated close to rivers for water power, but now coal that had you know, the coal fed these new engines, fed these new machines, and the coal was discovered in vast quantities uh, in Pennsylvania especially, but all throughout the United States, that the coal was dug out of the ground, shipped on the railroads to these new factories where goods were, were pushed out at, bef at, at unheard of rates. And this Yankee ingenuity and new inventions continue to pace. And each of these new inventions required factories and raw materials and supply trains and insurance and salesmen and stores that the economy of the United States in the first half of the, in the North, the economy of the North grew and changed constantly. The sewing machine was invented. And I'm sure many of you have seen this building. That's the I'm sure I hope you've seen this. This is down uh, near the port. This is one of it's probably the build, biggest building in Elizabeth. This is this is the Singer Sewing Machine Factory, one of the biggest sewing the biggest sewing machine company in the world. The Singer Factory had its or its Singer Company had one of its main factories in Elizabeth, and thousands of people worked on the five you know probably at least five floors above ground and probably at least two below ground, you know making sewing machines, uh, volt rubber. We don't think about humble little rubber, but rubber, as maybe you know, comes from a tree. But when rubber is taken out of a tree, uh, it can't be used in industry. And people knew what its, you know, its qualities were, but rubber cracked and it only could exist uh, on a very small temperature uh, scale. But then in the 1830s, um, a way to make rubber usable was invented. 
uh, is called vulcanization. And all of a sudden, rubber industry grew up around the world. That rubber trees were, uh, were grown on rubber farms where rubber trees grow and then shipped to the United States and England where it, went under, it underwent this process. And all of a sudden, this amazing material rubber uh, was available for, for everybody. A machine to make screws. Just, you know, the, the little uh, the threads on a screw make building things easier and stronger. Anyone who's, anyone who's ever built anything knows how much stronger screws are than nails. Uh, and just a machine that could make those threads was a huge advance. Lead pencils were invented. We don't have to, you know, dip quills in ink anymore. Uh, the agricultural implements we talked about, the plow, the reaper, precision tools, I mean, the list goes on and on, and we haven't even talked about railroads yet. I hope you get a sense from this that the economy of the North was growing, and rising wages meant more demand for goods and services, which led to more manufacturing, which led to more jobs, which led to higher wages, which led to more demand, which led to more supply that the United States was industrializing. And while it had its negative side effects, and some of those we're going to talk about, everyone, for the most part, looked at industrialization and said, this is a good thing. It is making us rich, and it is making us secure, and it is making us powerful, and the North kind of liked that. And the South looked at the North and said, whoa, you're getting really big, strong, and powerful. Who's doing all this work? To a very large degree, that a lot of this work is being done by the Irish. So let's talk about immigration, 1830 to 1850. This is really the start of a new chapter in American history. Number one, in 1830, the vast majority of non-slave Americans were of either English, Scottish, or German ancestry. That English were by far the largest group, and then the Germans and the Scotch were the only real competitors for that. That the Germans had been America's really only minority group um, for a long time. And German was spoken in many houses throughout the United States, especially in Pennsylvania. But they are mostly, they're all white, they are all Protestant, and if they're, the, the, everyone but the Germans were English-speaking. And German and English are so close that, you know, people learn to speak English very quickly. These groups assimilated and mushed together very quickly and very easily. As some of you commented in some of the last Paul Johnson uh, readings, immigration was free and easy. You got on a boat, you came to the United States, you stepped off the boat, and have fun. Good luck. Um, lots of people stayed in the cities. Lots of people moved out west to farm. The first immigrant groups, the Scots and the Germans, did not stay and work in factories. They moved west and started farms. That is going to change in the mid-1840s. Starting in 1845, there was a famine in Ireland. Ireland was a British colony. It's not an independent country. It's a British colony, and the British do not treat the Irish particularly well. There is a terrible... Ireland is a poor country. Um, and they suffered several consecutive years of devastating food shortages. Tens of thousands of Irish a year are going to make the journey to the United States, and tens of thousands of Irish a year died of starvation. Um, the poorest of the poor died. It was only those who could sell their houses, their farm tools, their you know, any animals they have to buy a ticket to the United States. Uh, escape that the population of Ireland in the 1840s went down by a third. Um, about half of that third came emigrated, and about half of that third died. Um, but tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of Irish are suddenly washing up on American shores. And it's gonna it's important to take a few minutes to talk about number three, the Irish in America. The Irish were the first immigrant group to encounter large-scale discrimination in the United States. And they were for, they, a lot of the arguments that Americans made about the Irish in the 1840s sound very similar, and were very similar, and many of the situations were very similar to Hispanic immigration today. I mean, listen to these reasons that Americans were concerned. The Irish were willing to work for much less money than American workers. 
There's lots of them. They are displacing American workers. They're living in their own ghettos. They don't speak English well. They have different religious beliefs. It's very similar in a lot of ways. But when these Irish arrived in America, they were willing to work for less money. They displaced farm women as the biggest, most common form of labor. If you remember, when the factory system started, it was done very largely by women. Uh, the machines are getting bigger, the machines are getting dirtier, the physical strength required to work them is increasing, and so these Irish immigrants with no other skills start working in these factories. Second of all, they're Catholic, and most, Protestant, most Americans are Protestant, and most Americans in the 1830s most associated Catholicism with authoritarianism, lack of an ability to govern yourself, lack of Republican, small-r Republican virtues, that the Irish just listened to the Pope and did whatever the Pope wanted them to do. Um, when the Irish wanted to educate their children in Catholic schools, most Americans said, oh my God, no way. You know, that's not a Republican education. You're not going to learn how to be a good, free citizen of the United States going to a school where, you, where they teach you to do everything the Pope says. That was the argument. The Irish were considered poor and dirty and barely a step above blacks. That many of the cartoons of the Irish that we're going to see, the cartoonists use the same physical stereotypes to draw the Irish as they do to draw blacks. And there are very few blacks in the North, but all of a sudden there's a lot of Irish. Factory life for these Irish becomes more difficult. Factories begin to demand longer hours for less pay because there is so much available labor for the factories. Factory owners can reduce wages and raise the hours you need to work. Living conditions around the factories begin to become unbearable. The Irish are not used to living in cities that they came from they were small farmers, dirt poor, small farmers in Ireland. And now all of a sudden they are thrown into this vast, new, dirty, loud city in a foreign land. And you can kind of get a good picture of the slums from that picture in your notes. That the engraving is from London, but it just as easily could be from New York. The wages are so low that children have to join their parents at work just to scrape by without starving. Um, that the material existence in these northern slums was awful. It was worse, materially worse, than slaves in the South. Slaves in the South got better food. Slaves in the South lived in better conditions. Slaves in the South were healthier than these slum dwellers in the North. And with poverty came crime. Crime, disease, corruption, gangs all growing up in American cities. Now we're going to get back to that in a moment, but I also want to, you to make sure that this was not a permanent situation for most people. This was for the unskilled. As soon as a worker learned a skill, they could begin to climb the social ladder in the United States. And they did. The Irish did not stay at the bottom of the ladder forever and ever. They climbed up out of it. And one of the things that we're going to take a look at at the very end of the year is how machine politics helped them do that. Um, but for unskilled workers, factory life is not an enjoyable thing. There is a major political response to this new immigration and these new people with their new problems. Many Americans were against Irish immigration and that attitude took on a political dimension. And it grew up in what would be called the American Party. And the American Party was a nativist party. N-A-T-I-V-I-S-T. -I -I a nativist party that grew up in the 1840s as a reaction to large-scale immigration. They are not known as the American Party to history. History knows them as the Know-Nothings. And they're called the Know-Nothings because it started out as a secret society. And when somebody came up to you and said, Hey, 
What do you know about this new anti-Irish group? You were supposed to say, I know nothing. Uh, and there were so many people going around saying, I know nothing, that uh, it became the nickname for the entire party. What was the American party or the Know Nothing parties? That, you have to know both names because both names could be on a test or on the AP exam. They were anti-Catholic, first of all. They pressed for lay control, meaning secular control over Catholic church policies. They, adv they advocated forced public education. They did not want the children of these Catholic immigrants going to Catholic schools. They advocated temperance because they thought that all Irish people were drunks. They wanted to make it difficult to become an American citizen. 21 years they wanted you to wait, uh, living as a resident alien, until you be could become a citizen. And they had some significant success, these know-nothings. They joined with anti-slavery Democrats and Whigs in the North uh, to create a strong political party, and they won a string of victories in the early 1850s. Um, so know-nothingism was a significant political force uh, in the United States in the 1840s and 50s until the issue of slavery kind of makes the issue of immigration go away. So that's the uh, experience of Irish immigrants in the United States in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, they made it. And, you know, you look today and the Irish are, you, you, I'm sure you guys, just, they're, they're just lumped in there with white people. Uh, but they have a very interesting American story themselves, the Irish. All right, letter C. And it's worth t turning this into a topic in and of itself. The railroads. Few industries changed the country like the railroads. All right, so let's have a look. Canals had greatly increased the amount of east-west commerce in the 1840s, especially the Erie Canal. We've talked about that at length. But new railroads would vastly increase the amount of internal traffic. The first steam locomotives were invented in England in the 1820s. And by 1830, the first American rail line carried 80,000 passengers down a 13-mile track in Maryland. By 1848, there's over 6,000 miles of track, mostly east of the Appalachians and mostly regional in nature. Because still in 1848, there were some significant technical difficulties. Engines were not powerful enough to climb over the Appalachian Mountains. Engines were not strong enough and rails were not strong enough to negotiate tight turns. Sparks coming out of the engine caused fires, tracks wore out, but by 1850, many of these issues began to be solved. And you can see in the picture the difference between an early locomotive and an 1860 locomotive, just how much more powerful and efficient and strong the trains were by 1860. From 1848 to 1860, the amount of track increased from 6,000 miles to 30,000 miles. And of that 30,000 miles, 90% of it is in the north. And it revolutionized the country. If you wanted to, 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 to move from Chicago to New York before the locomotives, it took you about three weeks. Now, for about $25, you could travel on a train from New York to Chicago in about two days. How is this paid for, the financing of all this incredible growth of uh, railroad stock and track? Money was at first privately raised. If a railroad company came to a town with a proposal, p um, people on the right of way would invest good money in the railroad. That if the railroad tracks are going to run there, and you could, you know, benefit from having a railroad in your neck of the woods, you would invest in the railroad company. And that worked uh, very, very well. State money began to be poured into railroads, and that led to some corruption. Um, there was political difficulties. Southern votes especially, and some New England votes, killed federal attempts at internal improvements. Um, they did not want the competition. Eastern farmers did not want competition from Western farmers that the railroads would bring. Um, but they were coming anyway. You know, you can't hold a technology like that down for so long. Uh, they were built in the south. The few railroads in the south were built by slaves. The railroads in the north were built by unskilled immigrant labor, very often Irish. 
The railroads led to another economic boom in the United States, and more as more and more people, and we talked about this earlier, could send more and more people, could send more and more stuff to more and more places. And the railroads, as they got built, tied together the Old West, the Old Northwest, and the Old East. And that's what makes the North. The North is created by railroads. The western section of the country gets tied together with the eastern section of the country over and by railroads. They developed a sense of nationalism that a person from Ohio started identifying with a person in New York and a person in Massachusetts with a person in Indiana because they were dealing with each other and they were buying things from each other. And that starts to be called the North. At the beginning of sectionalism, you had the East, or the North, the South, and the West. Now the North and the Old East combine with the Old West and make the North. And that was all due to the railroad. All right, letter D, the socioeconomics of the North. Number one, the North is based on a, ca a system of free labor and free capital, which means you can spend your money wherever you want, and you can work wherever you want. You are free to spend your capital the way you wish. You want to invest in a new factory? Great. You want to invest in a new railroad line? Great. You think you have a great idea to open a factory in Elizabeth, New Jersey? If you can raise the money, God bless you. If you want to build a railroad line from Elizabeth, New Jersey to Trenton, raise the money. Go ahead. Have fun. You want to hire people to do it? You have to pay them money. If there's not a lot of people who want to do it, you got to pay them more. That's free labor. If there's a million people signing up for 10 jobs, you can pay them less. Free labor, free capital in the North. Capital gets reinvested, so when a railroad company makes a lot of money, they take that money and they reinvest, reinvest it in new lines, new engines, new cars. When the sewing machine factory makes a lot of money, they don't take that money and you know throw it up in the air and dance with it. They build a second factory and then a third factory, and then a second railroad line, all providing opportunity and jobs for thousands and then millions of Americans. Class realities. The North, despite the existence of that urban um, slum class of mostly Irish, the North is generally a very fluid and mobile class system. Most people move between classes in their own lives. Um, a farmer moves to the city, gets a job, moves up. That was incredibly common. There is a very wealthy elite at the top that is forming based on industrial success. They are influential in politics, but not dominant. Americans never... Americans always kind of reminded people that at least, you know, in, in Americans' mind, all men were created equal, and all men voted, that, po that politics never became uh, the purview of the rich uh, in the United States. Like we said, number three, there's an underclass made up of immigrants who could not get ahead, and slums are an unpleasant reality uh, in cities. However, the, by and large, the backbone of the North is a vibrant and growing middle class material prosperity for everyone is becoming the norm. That by 1860, the average person lives in much more material comfort than they did in 1800. We've talked about uh, the religion in the North, the Second Great Awakening, making the churches dynamic, the reform movements. The North is growing and powerful and confident. And it looks at the South and it sees this old-fashioned elite-based, non-middle-class, non-industrial, non-commercial, and it looks at the South, and it, kind of, it almost looks at the South with pity. And it says to itself, and it says to the South, our system is better than yours in every possible way. And the South, number two, says, no, it's not. So let's have a look at this, uh, this society that developed in the South that was destroyed by the Civil War, and as the movie said, it was, it was made gone with the wind. 
The South is defined by its class system. So let's start with the elite, number one. The South is dominated by its elite in a way that the North never was. Popularly, we imagine that all white Southerners own slaves, but that is absolutely not true. Only three quarters of one percent of white Southerners owned over 50 slaves. There were fewer than 2,500 Southerners in the entire country that owned more than a hundred. Those are the elites. They lived on beautiful plantations and were the political, social, and economic leaders of the South. And you can see in the picture those beautiful mansions, beautiful houses uh, that they had built along European lines. Um, when we think of the Old South, we think of the elite plantation life because it's been immortalized in culture and film. Um, so let's talk about the whites because... Um, Besides being a class-based society, obviously the South was a society based on black and white, free and slave. The plantation was run by the patriarch, by the father, and his word was literally law. Uh, he often delegated the day-to-day -day running of his plantation to overseers, because uh, he was always away on business, away in politics, at the state capitol in Washington, uh, and the overseers were very often... Um, much nastier to the slaves than the owner was. Uh, but it was the overseers who were kind of overseeing the day-to-day -day lives of the slaves. The, the wife, the wife of the uh, plantation owner had immense responsibilities as well. She had to run this huge household socially and economically. Decisions that her husband could not make because he was away were made by her that the division of genders that happened in the North, man went to work, woman stayed home, was not the case in the South. In the South, work stayed at home, and that meant that the wives had huge responsibilities. Not only did the wife have economic responsibilities, but she was supposed to be refined and educated and well-dressed and beautiful, a Southern lady to the nines. The children of the, uh, of the slave owners were raised with the children of the slaves until around the age of six to eight. Child care was done usually by uh, a trusted slave and the black children and the white children were raised together. And after around, somewhere around the age of six to eight, all the children, both girls and boys, would be educated. Um, they would be classically educated. Music, rhetoric, history, religion, very little science, very little technology. Uh, that was not the purview of the elites. To do science and technology and business and manufacturing was for the money-grubbing middle class of the North. That was not something that good Southern gentlemen and their ladies did. Girls married young. Um, often to obviously people in the same upper crust socioeconomic class. And if you want to get a look, uh, a good look, at this elite Southern life before the Civil War, go watch the first half hour of one of the greatest movies ever made, Gone with the Wind. Living right there on the plantations, alongside the elite's family, were the slaves, let her be. Slaves were put to work around the age of six or seven. Before that, like we said, they were raised with white children. Some slaves were artisans or house servants, and they formed an elite within the slave communities. They were respected on one hand and reviled on the other. Respected because sometimes they could get a bit of education, they could learn a skill, and reviled because they were not just a common, everyday cotton picker. Um, and elites with education are always reviled by the mass of people below them, and that was a reality for a lot of these more elite slaves. But most slaves, both men and women, worked from dawn to dusk in the fields, mostly picking cotton. Sun up to sundown in the hot southern sun, picking cotton must have been... Long, tired, difficult, and boring uh, for, for a human being. At night, they would go back to their slave cabins, you know, built for them by their masters. They were generally very simple affairs. One room, a single fireplace, a raised floor. 
They were very usually uh, very off. Or they were usually very well cared for, neat, clean, uh, under control. It was an aspect of the slaves' lives that the slaves could control, uh, and it was something that they could take pride in, uh, their own dwelling place. And most visitors to plantations in the South commented on slave cabins as always being very well cared for and well kept. Slaves ate adequately. They did not eat well. They were not starved to death. They ate adequately. Caloric intakes uh, were often higher and more nutritious than northern factory workers. Whippings and punishments were at the whim of the master or the overseer and they could be meted out for any violation of the rules. Um, that the slaves were kept under control by the use of and by the threat of the whip. Only a sadist or a fool whipped his slaves to death because it was too valuable of an investment. But as a tool of punishment, the whip was used um, often enough. Some slave owners and overseers were kinder and gentler than others, but the reality for slaves in the South, uh, the whip was a part of that reality. By the 1820s, you could not legally kill your slaves. Uh, it was murder, uh, although the punishment was only a fine. Um, you killed a white man, you could hang for it. You killed a slave, you got a fine. Uh, but the state did offer that minimal level protection uh, for those uh, human beings in bondage. The religion of the slaves was um, Christianity. Um, it was encouraged among the slaves. Uh, a distinctive black religious culture grew up uh, in slave communities with songs and chanting, and that slave religious culture came north, you know, with the African Americans, with the black citizens of the United States um, in the 20th century. That uh, that was a very distinctive part of slave culture, and it was theirs. It was not white religion. It was Christianity with a cultural twist on it, and it was encouraged by the whites because Christianity from the time of Jesus has taught, look, life sucks now, but you will be rewarded with heaven. And no white slave owners came out and said that the slaves were destined to burn in hell. They kind of told the slaves, look, if you're a good slave here on earth, God will reward you in heaven. The slaves did what they could to be as normal as they could. They married. They had children. Slave marriages were not legally recognized, but slaves married anyway. Um, doesn't have to be legally recognized for, you know, two people to love each other. Slave marriages on large plantations were rarely broken up. Living down in Georgia on a large plantation, if you got married to someone and you were a slave, you would probably stay on that plantation for the course of your marriage. But on small farms, and areas where cotton was not grown, especially up in Virginia, breaking up families was very common. And the picture on the previous page says it all. Uh, to break up a family and sell dad down the river or sell your brother down the river to the deep south to pick cotton uh, is something that really needs no explanation. I mean, you just try to imagine it for a moment. It happened often, uh, especially up in Virginia. So that's the elite and their slaves. That's not the majority of white southerners. The majority of white southerners is number two, the yeomanry. If we remember Jefferson's yeoman farmer, this is the backbone of the south. It's the majority of southern whites. They were middle class, independent farmers. They grew the day-to-day -day things that the plantations needed. The plantations grow the...